as you guys know, there's you know the heroes of open source. Some of you may even have pictures of them on your mantle at home, between Linus Torvalds and Richard Stallman. You def we definitely ha talk about it quite a bit. We see it everywhere. I feel very awkward, like leaning into the microphone. <laughs> All right, very good. So we, we see markers and signs extolling the virtues of open source everywhere, all the more even in the, in the corporate arena. Google of open source, it even highlights everyone benefits. Use, release, support. You see it on Facebook. You see it, this is GitHub. Those of you who are familiar with it, open source software is blah, blah, blah. Work with the best in the field. All of these different examples highlight what it can do. So the question that we wanted to ask is open source, is it a buzzword, is it badge? We talk a lot about how in this arena where trust um, and facts and so forth are, are um, under a sale, is it just virtue signaling at the end of the day? Well. Forbes being the bastion of commercial interests, even they put on their, their blog platform, open source isn't a business model, it's a marketing strategy. Well, these are three of the commonly held notions of what open source offers. Collaboration, transparency, adoption, remixing, because you can take, extend it, build with it, and so forth. We think it may in fact be all of these things. How many of these actually apply to the very different and specific projects that we work on um, within scholarly communications? I don't know, it's a big question. But we did see one of the um, connecting ties to the projects that we've worked on, the ones that did grow, is that it's a framework for instilling trust amongst the community of users, forming the foundations, the conditions, the basis for growth. So we took the, um, we decided that we'll break out the rest of our time together to highlight three different use cases. We'll start off with DMP, move to Legato, and the third pro open source software project is Dash before we move into Q&A. So without further ado, DMP. Yeah, so I'm going to start with the DMP tool. Um, and this is a small scale project. So most of the projects that we work on in Scholarly Communications aren't huge enterprise projects, right? Many of them are small projects that have a very niche market. They're just about solving one specific use case or one specific issue. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, cons consistently happens with open source discussions is they think that success must mean that you're working on an enterprise level. Um, and not, not that we aren't, we, uh, you can't support production level um, software, but it doesn't necessarily have to be enterprise level. So this, this story is about a project called DMP Tool. So for those of you who are not familiar, DMP Tool is uh, an open source plot project. Um, it was, uh, it's really fun, it's focused on funders, uh, mandates around data sharing. The concept is that researchers come in, they fill out their data management plan for their grant applications, and to do that, they need some guidance. And there's different guidance for different funders, and there's diff because there's different templates for different grant applications. And it's really a learning tool for libraries and campuses to be able to discuss um, uh, with what good data management planning is and uh, how they can work with their researchers on their campuses. And this is just a very small scale project, right, where we at California Digital Library developed a tool. This is what it looks like. It's got a very specific uh, set of features. You log in, you create a, um, uh, you, you select which template you're interested in based on which grant you're ap applying for and then you fill out some questions and then it generates a data management plan. So this is not rocket science in any way. So, but what we did from the very beginning was think through what we wanted to do with this tool. There's not necessarily a market out there for, or a lot of competition in this marketplace around other DMPs, uh, tool making machines. It's not that we thought that we'd have a competitive advantage or it was a marketing ploy, but we knew that if we were able to um, build something in open source, we would be able to open ourselves up for that kind of collaborative spirit that was out there in both the library and research community. And so we focused on that. It did take some extra work. There was a lot of discussion about what the overhead is of creating things in open source and why are we doing a lot of this work around community building if we know there isn't a large DMP tool developer community. But 
come to find out, by, by doing that, we actually ended up um, attracting uh, support. And within our community, there is one other tool called DMP Online. It is just as under-resourced as ours is. Um, it's a very small uh, project out of the DCC in the UK. And they were looking over years to try and think about how they could also try to support this small tool over time. And so we came together and we thought, why don't we work together on actually building a platform that um, allows us to uh, expand the reach of both of our teams and create a collaboration around this, something that would not have been available and was not even understood at the beginning of the, the project. Now we're working on projects around machine actionable DMP. It has a a become a platform for innovation within the space. Funders and others have recognized this. We have working groups going on. We're working with DataSite on this project. Uh, there's a poster if you'd like to see it over there in the corner, and that Daniel Meachin just stood up to, to raise his hand around. Um, and it's become a rallying cry for people working on the innovations around machine actionable DMPs. Thank you. So he, the second story to build off of an open source project that was able to scale resources and, be get, and get bigger, um, the second story is, is about this open source software project called Legato, which I think was probably started around eight or nine years ago at PLOS. And some of those um, people who have actually worked on this project way back when are at this conference, um, including Martin Fenner, Juan pa Pablo Alperin, et cetera. Um, but the, the origins of it started within a single publisher, an open access publisher that wanted to better understand how we can measure um, the, the reach, the growth of the specific papers that it published. And um, they opened it up as an open source project so that others could also build off of it as well as host their own, whether it's to collect for their, their publications or other things altogether. And um, we, Martin named it after an Italian water dog or something. It does truff hunts or truffles. I don't know. Everyone remember exactly what it was. It was a long time ago. But that, that's actually kind of the story is that these things have histories. And whether or not we open source it, we, um, we can sometimes accelerate what happens to this. Originally, we built it just to follow conversations, be able to track things. Um, we used it to help guide readers when they were on a page. Do I want to read this really quickly? Um, what are my interests? We had secondary you know, metrics that were built off of it. Um, it was used to power and drive discovery navigation of all of the you know, um, articles that PLOS, the mega journals, et cetera, published. We had a visualization tool that allowed funders to be able to search and, and see in ways that weren't just numbers and so forth what was happening to these PLOS, art, PLOS publications. Um, but And there was quite a lot of effort in speaking to various other members, other publishers, other funders, and et cetera, about this need for having this data not just available for PLOS publications, but for all publications, not just all journal articles, in fact, but all research scholarly objects that are, are published um, and can be tracked. So um, this was a, a somewhat of a... Um, many story tale, lots of different twists and turns, but um, the Crossref got interested in the the, the notion of this, um, the aims of, of ALMs, of Legato, and at a certain point um, they began to explore what it could do and what um, how it might help the community at large, the community being all publishers, the community um, and stakeholders, meaning all of the other types of um, important um, research parties that are part of the larger scholarly ecosystem. Um, Crossref joined up with Datasite, so um, it has now become part of the infrastructure that any type of DOI that um, is, is registered with either of the two RAs is getting this um, data collected and, and made, you know, made available to any for, um, for reuse, for tracking. There's full evidence logs to be able to make sure that whatever has been collected um, is has been done properly, figure out what, are, what were the parameters and the conditions for the collection of this, all under the name of event data. I'm happy to talk separately about that. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, many of the data sources um, are the same. Um, we're, we're going to be growing the data sources that PLOS originally had. Um, the architecture is completely 
markedly different at this point in time, but the fruits of it is that um, the idea started with an open source project, an open source project that really gained, you know, some level amount of, of interest amongst the, you know, a smaller subset of the community. Now it's much bigger. A lot of things have changed. There is no visual representation. There are no quote unquote end user products for event data in the direct sense. Before there, there might have been plus ALMs and, and you know, on the article pages. Now there's JSON. So um, very, very different shift that we're talking about, which, um, which open source has made possible. But it's a shift into larger scale. Um, it's a different type of service, but also now community provisioned. Okay, um, since you guys talk so fast, I have all this time. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about the Dash project, and um, this is uh, going all the way back to 2014. Um, these are some of the fun highlights of that year, in case you needed a memory of how long ago that was. Uh, back in 2014, I gave a talk at iAssist um, uh, for Dash, and I am no longer at the CDL. Now I'm at um, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. But um, back then I was working on Dash as well as DMP tool, and um, Trisha Cruz, who was my uh, my boss at the time, who's also here and is now the ED of Data Site, we um, we found ourselves um, really thinking about reimagining what the institutional repository looked like, and. Um, this is an actual slide that I used. I was just so 2002. So uh, they were, um, this was a talk, you know, for a community that's very familiar with institutional repositories. And um, they tended to be used for open source, uh, or sorry, open access versions of manuscripts. And so they weren't normally um, considered as something that could be used for data. Um, and then, of course, we had that um, mandate come down from the top that people needed to start thinking about public access to research products. That was in 2013. And um, I really was hoping that IRs were going to be kind of saving the day and coming in and um, making this much easier for researchers uh, to be able to comply. But um, <laughs> when you start looking at some of the repositories, this is, again, from 2014. So the KNB has been redone since then. This is the Knowledge Network for Biocomplexity, which um, this is their uh, URL, or sorry, their, um, their user interface for um, entering data into their, um, their platform. And uh, as someone who's had to go through this process to enter data into their platform, because I was part of the Data One project, it's uh, miserable. So um, think about that versus, um, at the time, 2014, Figshare, right? So Figshare um, looked not dissimilar to how it looks now, which is that it was a relatively simple user interface that made it pretty easy for people to go in and um, deposit their data. And of course, I have lots of things on Figshare. I love Figshare. Figshare's great. Um, however, Trisha and I were thinking, how can we really compete with places, uh, uh, organizations like Figshare? Um, how can we make things that are more um, open source, that are more community oriented? And so that was really where the idea of Dash came from, um, to simplify data to deposit for the UC system at large, and then um, to really make it open source and to figure out how we could grow a community around an open source project for institutional repositories. Uh, and so this is our super snazzy interface that we made. Uh, and we uh, were pretty excited about it at the time. And it had faceted search and browse, as you can see, um, citations and license information. Um, you had to describe your data set. There were only two pages. Um, I only put the first one up. Uh, and then you dragged and dropped your files, just like you did in the um, handy Figshare. And we had it all on GitHub so that people could um, see the code if they wanted to. I took this screenshot today, so everything's old. But um, you can see that we were trying really hard to push this out to the community. Uh, so now we fast forward to, um, oh, sorry, we were, what we did was really focus on that clean design and the idea that this was an open source alternative uh, to something that came out of a for-profit company or from publishers or from uh, groups that weren't libraries. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the tech community really didn't take off very much. So we didn't have a ton of people contributing code to the Dash repository and lots of organizations kind of taking it up and making it their own. Um, we did have some. We had quite a bit of uptake within the UC system. But um, we really thought, well, maybe we should improve the interface. So we um, went to the Sloan Foundation, and they gave us a grant, which we put up on eScholarship, which is um, the open access platform for the University of California. And it's still there today. So the, the grant was Dash, Improving Community Repositories for Better Data Sharing. And um, that money was used to kind of revamp the entire um, interface. And this was work that was done not by me, but by people that followed, Trisha and I both, um, at the CDL, including John Chidaki and Daniela Lowenberg and who else? Other people. 
Scott Fisher. Yeah, so now we're in 2016, which was a rough year, um, except for Justin Bieber, he's great, but the other things were not <laughs> so great. Uh, <laughs> and um, we have a new fancy interface in 2016. Um, Dash um, is looking a lot more um, fancy and it's an easy to use data publication service. Um, the interface is um, quite nice and um, we have ORCID integration and lots of citations. Here's the drag and drop file upload section, which is lovely as well. Um, search results and um, faceted search is still there. And um, they have a great um, uh, website that's um, built into the GitHub uh, repository, which has like, very easy ways for people to understand how they can participate in the project and um, connect and contribute to the project if they want to. So um, Dash is doing well. Uh, except now it's even doing better because as of May, um, California Digital Library and Dryad announced a partnership. So if you're not familiar with Dryad, they're um, a, a kind of a long-lived repository for data that sits alongside publications. Um, it used to be for ecology and environmental sciences. Now it's kind of more broadly available for any, uh, any data deposit alongside a publication. Uh, I'm on the board of Dryad. That's a conflict of interest statement, and so is Jennifer. And uh, John, of course, is involved in the partnership with Dryad. And so we're really excited about this partnership because we see it as a chance to um, really br breathe new life into both Dryad and um, the Dash project. And so the new partnership is um, focusing on uh, having a new product development team. We're migrating the classic Dryad repository onto the CDL Dash technology. And um, there's going to be a lot of transporting, reporting, transparent reporting and curation within the administrative layer of the, um, the new Dryad. And lots of submission features um, that are going to be more enhanced and fancy. So um, this is possible because um, really we were thinking about it as an open source project for the tech community originally, but it turns out um, it's actually more about being open source so that people get more excited about being partners. And um, we're sticking to our values of open source back in the day, even though we didn't really have a huge community that was building up, but that allowed um, an organization like Dryad to come in and um, want to work with us and work with them. I'm just gonna keep saying us, even though I don't work there anymore. Um, and so I'm guessing um, John and others would have other comments about how this, um, this collaboration, this partnership are working in terms of the framework of, you can come on up, of uh, how, how it's happening for Dryad as well as Dash. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, so I think um, we'll take the rest of the time before Q&A just to talk at a higher level about what we've t run through very, very rapidly. Open source is not a magic bullet. It's not going to save the world. It's not going to cure cancer or whatever. Um, it, but we have noticed that it is at the basis um, of many different projects that have been able to grow, whether it's the technology, whether it's the base of users, whether it's the community and organizations that are supporting it. And, and obviously money ties into this as well. And there is no single profile that will match every single successful project. So I think that it's less about looking at a formula of this is what we need and therefore open source will serve this and this and this. I think it's about building the environment by which some of these things can come out as first fruits. Um, but that's that's my my I guess overarching. Yeah. And I, I mean the example of DMP tool is really to illustrate that it's not um, it's not just applicable in certain types of projects, but applicable at all levels. Um, many times we work on small scale projects and we think what is how do we reduce the overhead um, and not try to take on more scope, thinking that there's only kind of short term gain for things. But um, there are a lot of examples where open source small projects then lead to collaborations and opportunities for efficiency in the future. Uh, we wouldn't be able to continue with the DMP tool without a collaboration, and we wouldn't have had the collaboration unless we would have invested in the open source up front. And another one of the things that occurred to me as, as we're talking through this is that at least for these three projects, they've been around for a while. And there was a reason for why we chose these three individuals, because we were we're on, we represent um, the original software projects or the open source software efforts, which then grew, right? We, we can also do the flip side and, and bring on those who are now involved in, in, um, in the larger and bigger thing. But um, you know, as someone who originally worked on Legato, eight years ago. It's been a long ride. We couldn't have foretold all of the different things that would happen along the way, the different groups who would be interested in getting along, um, getting getting involved in this, whether to help build it, build it or to host it or to implement it. We didn't envision how much the technology would in fact change. 
eight years down the road. Obviously, that's 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 a given. But I, I think the, one of the things is, you know, if we if we're looking at longer term evolution, there's so much that we don't know, and um, and open source may be one of the ways in which we mitigate the risk of these unknowabilities. Yeah. Should we take questions? Yeah. We can take questions if anybody has any. I don't really have a question I would like to put in a plug for a, an initiative that tries to address the uh, issue that you've just outlined. Um, it's called the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tools. Some of you are actually involved. Um, and so uh, this is a, an initiative that tries to bring together different um, initiatives that all operate in the open science space. Almost all of them have an open source component, and they basically um, have all learned those lessons that were just uh, presented. And it is trying to bring together those different initiatives in a way that uh, we can actually plan together more than we have been doing in the past, so that if we know that you over there are already building that feature that we would like to have, then we can uh, focus on something else that maybe supports you in their work and then uh, adds additional features or more stability or whatever, these kind of things, jrost.org. Yeah. We, um, yeah, so for those that um, may be on the recording and stuff, uh, Daniel is just highlighting uh, JROST, J R O S T dot org, is a kind of collaboration around open science tools. Does that work? Yeah. Adam from um, Coco, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think in open source there's this um, interesting question, which is the chicken and egg, right? <clears throat> what comes first, the product or the community? And I'm just wondering if you have any, like, just very quick takeaways on, on any wisdoms on that um, dynamic. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I, can I take the easy way out and say they have to grow together? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's hard to get the community engaged if it's just this kind of um, notion that um, is hard for people to, to grapple with. Um, but then again, um, it's really difficult to get something built unless you have um, a lot of resources that are kind of um, there for you to play with, uh, which is usually not grants since grants have deliverables. Yeah, and, and also we, um, so we're not technologists. We don't yeah. program. So um, uh, very often we're in conversations about what does it mean to be a successful open source project? And often uh, that's with non-programmers as well. And there's always the assumption that that means that there must be programmers all working together on open source, uh, like co coding and um, doing fancy coding stuff together. Um, but actually, what we're trying to highlight here is that um, we we learned something that maybe the programmers already know, which is that it's not about the product, it's or not about the the programming. It's about the community. It's not about the, th the fancy thing, it's about the community that's being built. And in each of the cases that we're talking about, there are projects that, um, that had a lot of uh, expectations of what success would be, that later on we realized that the real value was not those success metrics, but the community that we could, have, we could enable. Uh, and it was not necessarily the community that people were thinking around the coders, but also around product development, uh, market potential, uh, reach. Uh, uh, efficiencies, these types of things. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Just a quick question in terms of um, being first to market. I feel like a lot of open source projects are in response to something that's already available that's not open source. Um, so for example, you said Figshare. And I think maybe, do you see maybe that's why um, some open source projects don't take off? It's because, you know, there is, why would people want to switch from something that's already there, like Figshare, into an open source project? Perhaps maybe if um, the project actually started on open source, the community would be a lot larger. I don't know, do you see kind of the first to market benefit? There was no preceding type of service or project prior to the very first instantiations of the PLOS article level metrics. I, I, I think that it's, it's just a very case by case context. And so there are maybe a lot of reasons for why things don't take off or, yeah, or perhaps do. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, 
Trisha and I can um, wax poetic over drinks about what happened with Dash and why it didn't kind of explode on the scene. I think um, in the case of Dash, it was just a simple matter of um, we were trying to get researchers to deposit data in a new place, but they re weren't really depositing data anyway. And then also we were trying to figure out how to get libraries on board, but libraries had a lot of hesitancy around what is, you know, how are we going to pay for this and how are you going to charge us and what does that mean for our community? And so there were just a lot of parts of the community that we hadn't resolved yet that I think inhibited its ability to really grow. Um, but that's different from the technology community, which I think is probably more what you're talking about. Oh, we're done. Yeah, one more? Yeah. We can do Andrew, Andrew one more. Right there. Hi. I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about the role of commercial for-profit uh, companies in open source projects, whether you think it's um, you know, potentially valuable resources or whether it's maybe poisonous to the, you know, to the goals of an, particularly in open science, I guess. We all actually, hate we're money. All, we we're, hate money. We no. were out of time. Sorry. We didn't have time for that. <laughs> Um, maybe that's uh, something else for overdrinks as well. I mean, uh, basically, from my perspective, personally, from my perspective, I'd say that it's community. Um, community is what we're talking about, and you know, the organizations where people work is one thing. But I think Bianca Kramer was saying this yesterday that um, it's not the it's not just the organizations that um, we're worried about, you know, colonizing or being evil or corrupting. But it's because what we should be focusing on is the players and the people and the community within that that we're focusing on and. And again, open source is about community connections, and it's about being able to have that community conversation. Um, and so as long as there are good actors that, are, that you're working with, um, maybe it, it's less important about where they work. Yes, I, I'll just close with a pitch for this um, concept that we've been trying to build separate from this particular presentation. It's called Supporters. There's a poster for it. Um, there is a website where you can download an ebook. Um, there's a physical limited copies floating around somewhere of, of, of this book called Supporters, a Guide to Research Co Communications. And the, the um, upshot of this is it lays out, it proposes a number of different types of ways in which supporters, those who participate in supporting research communications, can work together. And one of the things that is specifically delineate, delineated in there um, is, you know, it is an open community and we should be inclusive. And there, um, you know, it's based upon how we act, not based upon the organizational name, the business model, et cetera. Anyway, we, this is um, to start a community conversation. So I think really it's, it's, it's to start the conversation. And um, you can't do that until you read it. So supporters.guide is the website. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, all three of you, for talking about those wonderful, wonderful projects. <laughs> and <laughs>